Welcome to the Sam and Joe VA Show, where we teach women just like you how to create your very own in-demand virtual assistant business. We're your hosts, Sam and Joe, and get ready to have the control, flexibility and freedom you've always dreamed of. Welcome to episode 28, what to expect as a subcontractor to a VA agency. Mm, because not everybody wants to run their own VA business, do they? They don't want to have to go out and network and find clients and sell themselves. So for those people, becoming a subcontractor is ideal for them. Yeah, absolutely. There is not everyone is um, cut out, I suppose, to be or has what it takes to be a VA um, business owner. Because it, like you say, Sam, it does have you needing to be the salesperson. And I know that that is not for everyone. So actually being a subcontractor to a virtual assistant agency is a really legitimate option. Um, Mm -hmm. It really suits uh, some virtual assistants and you can still um, have the flexibility, the freedom, the control uh, by, by being a subcontractor. So, so let's define what a VA agency is and what we mean by a subcontractor. Yeah. So when we talk about a VA agency, we talk about someone like you, Joe, who has, uh, their own VA business, but they've taken it a next step further and they've got, uh, VAs who work for them and with them. Mm. So I have a mixture of employees and contractors. So subcontractors. Uh, I I treat them all like my team members and they all work directly with clients and deliver our virtual assistant services. Uh, so yeah, the, the subcontractor, it means that you are contracting to the agency. So technically the agency is your client, you're doing work for them, uh, but they're going to assign you to their clients. So you're going to work directly with clients in some cases. Some cases they might send you tasks and projects that you send back to them and they deal directly with the client. Um, So there's a few different ways that they might actually have that set up. But essentially, yeah, you are, well, the agency is, is your client and you're doing work for them. Um, and doing work for their clients on behalf of the agency. So that's what we mean by agency and subcontractor. Yeah. So we've had, Should we... there's been a few questions and, and um, issues and uh, things that come up in this sort of new developing um, and booming uh, industry within New Zealand. Even though it's not a new industry it's that it's it feel feels like we're really now have just started with this real boom in New Zealand where we're seeing a lot of VAs coming into the industry a lot of subcontractors a lot of agencies um, and it has really taken off in the last couple of years hasn't it yeah and I think especially last couple of years for sure but especially the last six months or so um, since COVID hit, lockdown happened, mm. people lost their jobs, very sadly. Um, other people are then looking around and going, right, well, we all work remotely at the moment. Um, what's this VA thing? Maybe there's something in it after all. So we've definitely seen an increase in those looking to hire VAs and those looking to become VAs, whether that's subcontractor or, or freelancer. Um, should we talk a bit about the expectations that a VA agency owner has um, when it comes to their subcontractors? Yeah, there's there's a really there, there are really key expectations and things that you need to be aware of as a subcontractor um, because hiring contractors is a real risk for agency owners and they their reputation is on the line. They're putting their business name out there to the world, to the clients, and it really comes back to them. Like any issue or mistake or anything like that, it really comes back on the VA agency owner. So they're going to be wanting to hire the best contractors um, who are going to deliver the best services for the clients. So some of my expectations that I have from um, contractors, um, one is that they wouldn't ever speak about their own 
um, freelance um, VA business or their VA business that they're trying to grow. Uh, I expect all of my contractors to act as if they are just another team member of my agency. Um, and so they only speak of working for, say, Strictly Savvy, my agency. Mm-hmm. So they, they never would um, talk about their business or like other things that they could do outside of this um, contract that they have with the agency. Like that, that is that is definitely a fear and a risk with hiring contractors. Um, so whatever you can do as a contractor to um, give that agency owner the confidence and the reassurance that, um, you know, this relationship um, is valuable to them. They want to do a great job. They want to represent you well. Um, well, yeah, will will be really good for the relationship. So I think that comes to honesty um, mm. and just being really upfront and having the upfront com- conversations about the expectations. Uh, I had a really great contractor um, who worked with me maybe about a year ago uh, and she had listened to quite a few things um, that we had been talking about previously on lives and videos. And so she really understood the fears around hiring contractors and um, how devastating it is for a agency owner when a contractor steals clients or, you know, circumvents the relationship and starts working directly for um, for a client, which is, yeah, really hard because as a as an agency, you've put a lot of time and effort into marketing, getting mm-hmm. leads in, talking to that client, getting them signed up. Um, working out what they need, hiring the contractor. Like there's a lot of time um, that goes in leading up to that very first um, task that, that gets undertaken for a client. So um, yeah, that's that's definitely a fear. And I had this contractor who um, understood that really well. We had a great sort of induction and conversation in the beginning. And then the client actually went directly to her and said, hey, I see that, you know, maybe they Googled her name or something like that. I see that you have your own business. Um, You know, could we do some like extra hours, like just me directly with you Um, and pretty much cut Strictly Savvy out of it. Now, the contractor was amazing. (laughs) She she said, no, like any work that I do for you has to go through Strictly Savvy. Um, And then she actually told me that this has happened so that I was aware um, and then we could uh, make sure we had a conversation with the client or keep building that relationship with the client. Um, and we were aware of what was happening. And that was really awesome and loved having her work for me because like that integrity um, yeah. was was really, really awesome. And so I think you've, as a contractor, you've got your own reputation on the line as well. And Sam, this is a small industry in New Zealand. It's getting bigger, but it's Mm. with those core agencies and contractors, it's a really close knit um, and small industry. So everyone knows everyone. And if you're going to do that to an agency and, you know, steal clients from them, then yeah, it's it's not going to go well for you for the rest of your business and career that you're wanting to build so yeah make sure that you have that integrity intact Um, and if you want to grow your agent your own agency or your own business then be really upfront with the VA agency owner about that and then like you need to be finding your own clients and doing your own marketing and getting your own leads don't be tempted by the 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 ease and the money mm. of stealing the client because it yeah it just won't go well um in the end yeah it's, it's it's really interesting um you're right there's an absolute fear I think it's probably the biggest fear a VA mm. um agency owner or a VA that's looking to all of a sudden grow their team they haven't done it before I would say their biggest fear is losing clients to their their growing team, to their subcontractors that they're bringing bringing on board, um, and you, you kind of you touched on it. I think some of the subcontractors, because it does, it's it happens. Mm. You know, we, we've heard about it. This does happen. Oh, I've had and, it happen multiple times. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's a valid fear that yeah. VA agency owners have. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it? I think a lot of the subcontractors that maybe have found themselves in this situation, they maybe have gone in to the subcontractor role um, thinking that they would never, ever steal a client. Like, that's not part of their their morals. There's no way I'd do that. Don't worry. 
but then they've built a really close connection and relationship with a a particular client. They may have been working with them for six months, a year. Um, They, you know, they click really well. And then all it takes is for that client to go, hey, hey, would you? Should I just give you some stuff kind of like on the side? We'll just, you know, we'll navigate around, you know, who we've been going through up until now. Um, so I can see that it would be really tempting, really, really mm. tempting. But as you said, Joe, it's actually just not worth it, especially, especially for those of you in New Zealand, small community, it's going to get out there and you do not want that reputation. You do not want to be known is that person that steals other people's clients because as you said it takes a lot of time and effort to find those clients in the first place Mm. yeah absolutely valid fear valid fear so um and we're also i know you you joe when you're looking to bring on subcontractors you don't mind if the subcontractor is um looking for their own clients as long as they're upfront with you which is cool but i know there are also a lot of other VA agency owners that don't if they know that there's a subcontractor that is running their own business that's also finding their own clients they won't even give them a chance they just want somebody that only wants a subcontract so that's just something to be aware of yeah I think that that's around um you know wanting to have your contractors remain available for you uh and um you know that that fear around stealing of clients i think that's the main driver for that with from agencies um i don't mind so much because i know that i can't give someone full time work um you know straight off the bat and it's going to mm. take time to build that up so i don't want to have any i don't want to restrict them in their earnings um by you know saying that you have to be exclusive to me so yeah that's that's why i don't do that um, and I just make sure that I keep that really strong relationship with them, keep communicating, make sure that they're communicating with me and so that I can plan and be aware. Like if they get too busy um, and, you know, at least if I know that in advance, then I can actually plan for that and have them move to someone else or hire another contractor. Um, mm. So, yeah, I think it just all comes down to communication and, and integrity. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, should we should we talk a little bit about – um, when you're first subcontracting out to somebody, the fact that chances are you're not going to have full-time hours from them straight away. Like it may start trickling in. It may be quite inconsistent to start with. Let, let's touch yeah. on that. I think that's one of the cons of being a subcontractor is that you're really relying on the agency to give you work. And sometimes, you know, clients might pause or cancel or, you know, they have week where well, they have work one week, but not the next week. So it can be inconsistent. Uh, I like to try and give my contractors, um, I actually assign a client to, a, to one of my contractors so that they um, have all of the service plan hours. So most of our clients are on service plans where they're actually made of, made a, have actually made a commitment to a minimum number of hours. So then I can say to my contractor, hey, so this is a 25 hour client. So it's going to be an hour a day. It's going to be 25 hours each month ongoing. So then at least that contractor can then actually plan for that and and know what they're going to um, be earning month to month. Um, from from that client and from from the agency Mm. Um, so yeah I think there's definitely going to be some inconsistency and you won't be able to rely on a minimum number of hours from um, an agency unless they have some really good service plans in in place so yeah just be aware of that some some might be project work where you um, get a task complete the task send it back to the agency and some you'll actually be assigned to a client and working with them directly um, and, ma- and managing that client so yeah a few options mm. Mm. okay let's let's take a few steps backwards now and talk about the expectations you would have as an agency owner um, around that um, interview process mm-hmm. what are you looking are you expecting a cv are you expecting like a really good linkedin profile are you expecting both a portfolio if it's creative what are you expecting yeah i i treat the recruitment process slightly differently to an employee 
Um, so an employee, I would do a full and full, not induction, but yes, that too, um, a full <laughs> recruitment process where like it's a meet and greet and a formal interview. But I sort of speed things up with a contractor because there is less less risk hiring a mm. contractor. Um, but the, the same sort of elements are there. So first, I would have a phone uh, call with them and just check on availability. You know what their goals are with their are they growing their own business like um, what other clients have they got Um, just so I can get a really good gauge on how responsive and available they're going to be yeah Um, then I will talk about um, you know their past experience so some of them send me a CV anyway so I already have that now if they had a LinkedIn profile then I wouldn't need to see the CV but I do want to see one or the other so that I can have a look at the experience how long they were in roles what they did what their responsibilities were Mm -hmm. just like I would with an employee Uh, so yeah that gives me a really good steer on um, what they would be capable of like what level of let's say I'm hiring um, someone with EA experience um, executive assistant experience then I'll be checking and seeing what level is it CEO level is it like just um, senior manager or general manager what sort of level is it Mm -hmm. Uh, and then if I'm comfortable on the phone um, with what we've discussed I'll ask them a few questions Um, you know, things like if I'm hiring an EA, it will be, you know, what do you think are the top three attributes of, of an executive assistant? Um, do maybe a behavioral based question, like tell me about a situation where you made a mistake. What did you do to rectify it? Um, just so I can like, like I would an employee, just so I can see how they've handled situations and sort of what sort of answers they have in terms of those, um, for a creative, I would definitely want to see a portfolio, even a social media manager, I want to see some social media accounts that they actually manage. So it could be that they send me some links. Um, if it's graphic design, they'll send me a portfolio or photography. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, you need to have those things ready. Um, CV or LinkedIn, and then a portfolio if it's creative or social media. Cool. Then if I'm so, super happy, mm, the next mm. step would be to do a trial task. Um, so I would send something that is like maybe maximum 30 minutes and, um, I'm happy to pay for trial tasks. Sometimes it might not be paid. Just make sure that you're aware of, of what that is. Um, but I think an unpaid trial task is absolutely fair. Um, you know, it's, you're, you're putting, yeah, it's part of an interview process. Um, so yeah, I think you could definitely expect that. Yeah, especially um, if it's yeah. only a thirty, if, especially if it's only a thirty-minute job as well. I mean, it'd be different if you were asking them to do six hours, three hours, oh. even. But, but thirty minutes, yeah, you're going to do that yeah. if you want the job badly enough, aren't you? Exactly. Yeah, I think it's a good investment. Mm. Um. Yeah. The, so that then I suppose the next step is if um if I am happy with the trial task. Uh, then I would get a contract together. So you should never do work for an agency without a contract. It just really outlines what the expectations are, um, how available you're going to have to be, what you've agreed with the rate. So uh, yeah, if you are a subcontractor, make sure that you have the rate conversation in that very first (laughs) interaction with the agency. Because look, if, if it's so far out, you know, you're you're charging, you want to charge out X dollars and the agency is only charging out like slightly more than that or the same, then it's just not going to work. So don't waste your time or their time by avoiding that awkward conversation because it doesn't have to be awkward. You're a business owner to a business owner. Like it's, it's a service that you're providing to the agency just like any other business transaction. So why not just talk about the rate up front? Um, I think it's great, Sam, that on the... So if you're in New Zealand listening to this, there is a contractor internal directory within the um, VA, New Zealand VA network. And that's really great that you have the rates in there because it's really easy for me as an agency. I went on there yesterday because I need to hire a contractor. Hey, look, I can see the experience. I can see the rates. And then I like that conversation is a lot easier because I already know their range. And so I already know whether it's going to fit within what I'm um, expecting to pay. Mm, mm. So in terms in, in terms of prices, <laughs> pricing can be a polarizing um, topic to talk about, but we need to <laughs> we need to talk about the fact that if you are subcontracting 
to a VA agency, you are not going to be earning the same hourly rate as you would if you were a freelancer um, or business owner going out and looking for your own clients. So let's talk about why. Why you're going to expect a lesser hourly rate. Yeah, I think uh, as an agency, we're charging out our clients at whatever our hourly rate is. Now, it's not going to make commercial sense for us to hire someone that we're paying the same amount that we're paying, that that our client is paying us. Like that just isn't commercially viable. Um, So the expectation is going to be that, so if we use real numbers, like let's use my numbers so people can get a, a gauge on this. So, so these we, are New Zealand uh, dollars. Let's just New, say, Zealand these are dollars. New Zealand dollars, everyone. Yeah. Not US dollars, New Zealand dollars. So New Zealand dollars, we charge out between $65 and $97 an hour for our services. $97 is the photography advisory training on zero, that sort of stuff. Um, so the main sort of services that we provide where I'll be hiring a contractor is between sort of $65 and $75. Mm-hmm. Now, I um, pay my contractors between $35 and $40 an hour so that I've got about a $25-ish dollar margin on um, whatever um, we're charging. Or our, yeah, we're charging our clients. I'm then expecting to pay like $25 less than that to a contractor. So that's my profit um, to be able to then cover the sales time that we spend, the account management time, the um, sending the invoice to the client, following them up if they don't pay, um, all of that stuff, the internal management of that, the internal management of the contractor, having those conversations with them, checking in with them, seeing how they're going, et cetera. So it might feel like, oh, $25 an hour for doing nothing seems like a lot like a lot <laughs> of money, but actually we've got to make sure that we realize that the agency is actually spending quite a bit of time keeping that relationship with that client, keeping the client happy and doing the admin that just comes with um, yeah. have, having clients and running a business. So, yeah, that's that's the, the numbers, some real numbers for my agency. Now, other agencies might pay less, they might pay more, they might charge out less, they might charge out more, but that just gives you a, a bit of an idea. Um, now, that $40 an hour, I only... Uh, higher experienced um, subcontractors so experienced Mm -hmm. in that they have actually already built up the skills that I need they already have a career behind them Um, so I'm not training them on how to do the tasks I'm just training them on how to be a good virtual assistant for the client and you know how it works in terms of delivering a service and talking about budgets with clients keeping an eye on budgets and um, you know, delivering delivering the service. So not the actual task that they're completing. Mm, yeah, does mm. that make sense? It does. It makes absolute sense. Um, so in terms of that kind of the induction, any train, particular training that's required, um, attending team meetings, mm-hmm. let, let's talk a bit about um, chargeable hours. So what yep. should a subcontractor expect to be charging out for? Yeah, so this could vary between agencies. And so um, I'm just going to talk from my experience and what I do, but obviously you need to have this upfront conversation with the agency to see yeah. what they are offering and how they run things. Um, and, you and you know, there's no right or wrong way to do this. There's no law that says that uh, you have to do it this way in terms of, you know, what you can charge for and what you can't charge for. Like that's absolutely a conversation that you need to have with the the VA agency. And for me, it's, it's, I have in my contract that you, as a contractor, you can only charge me for billable time that I can successfully on charge to a client. So, this is my safeguard and this is my me incentivizing the contractor to do the best job and to, to do a really um, considered quality job for my clients. Mm-hmm. So if they make mistakes or, you know, big errors because they didn't double check or something like that and I can't on charge that to a client, the client has said I'm not paying for that, 
then that puts it back on the contractor. So it's just a bit of an incentive to make sure that they're doing a really great job. Because what you mm. don't want to get into a situation as an agency owner is that, you know, someone has done like 10 hours of work and then six of those hours, there was this massive mistake. The client's unhappy. They don't want to pay for it. And then if I had then said in my contract that I'll pay for all of those hours, then I actually just lost money. Um, It cost me more for them to deliver the service than I actually made. Yeah. So that's me avoiding that situation. Um, But yeah, I I think um, in terms of the team meetings and the induction and the training and stuff, um, this is a really important conversation to have with the agency um, because you do not want to get down the track and you've like come to team meetings and then you put it on your invoice and they're like, I never agreed that you could charge me for that. Um, mm-hmm. So it just avoids that conversation. Yeah. So Awkward. as an agency, I need to um, be mindful and conscious of what internal non-billable stuff I'm asking of contractors um, because they can only they can only charge me um, for billable time that I can on charge to clients. So what I say to my contractors is, um, so once I start doing some consistent hours and a decent number of hours, I'll add them into one of the team meetings and I'll say, and I'll pay you to attend the team meeting. Mm -hmm. So a couple of my contractors, so one of them does around 25 hours a week. The other one does around maybe slightly more. And so I actually have them initially, it was just coming to one, one per week. And now I've said one comes to three per week and the other one comes to two. So You've got to be mindful as an agency owner about how much um, internal time you're going to pay them for, because it just that just cuts out of the margin. So if I'm if I'm paying them to come to two team meetings and it takes an hour, then that hour is me then paying them forty dollars. So they the first two hours that they do for that month, I'm not going to make any money from. So if they're only doing two hours a month and you get them to come to a team meeting, then there's just no point having that contractor so yeah you've got to you've got to work out when is the right time for them to be coming to to internal things that you're going to pay them for Mm -hmm. and if I'm expecting them to come to a team meeting I'm going to pay for that some of the some of the things that we do is like team building things or um, we do Thursday night drinks Those, those things are optional so I'm really clear in the invite that says this is compulsory for all employees Um, And contractors, like, we would love you to come along, feel free, Um, it'll just be on your own time. So then they can make Mm. that decision. If they want that team atmosphere and stuff, it's on their own time. Yeah. Um, Yeah, is that, did that cover it? Yeah, yeah. The induction is maybe the next thing. So I have an online course that I've created for contractors to induct them, so I don't have to keep repeating myself. So it's the training on our systems. Um, how to deal with clients, what the expectations are and stuff. So uh, I allow up to two hours paid for them to be onboarded and inducted with us. So that's watching the videos, reading the stuff, um, getting access into their emails. There'll be a bit of like setting up their Chrome profile. They'll have to liaise with um, my office manager to make sure that they can access everything. Um, Most of the time we set up an email address depending on what they're doing with clients. Um, And so, yeah, up to two hours to get them inducted is paid. uh, And then the rest of the time is them um, just billable in team meetings. So there shouldn't be anything else that they're doing that's non-billable and charged. You'd expect your subcontractors to have their own tech equipment, I assume? Definitely, yeah. So if you're providing equipment, then you are... So in New Zealand, you're really flirting with the rules about who's an employee and who's a contractor Mm -hmm. and how the IRD actually defines that. So absolutely, contractors are their own business owner. Um, They have their own equipment. I provide the software so that they have Microsoft Office 365 um, because I need them to have access to that and to ours so they can access our SharePoint and have an email address, et cetera. So I set them up with software. Um, But absolutely, they have their own equipment, desk, chair, laptop, internet, work from home, etc. And I never Mm -hmm. have any expectations on them coming to, we have an office pod, which is like a container, Um, a really nice container though, that sounds like it's (laughs) cold and tingy and horrible, Um, but like a a fancy um, fancy. office pod, 
in our backyard. So I never expect them to come or start at a certain time or anything like that because that is where you then start to have an actual employee, um, not a contractor. And so that can have complications down the track with IRD. So yeah, I'm really clear on they manage their own time, um, but I these are the expectations that the client has. Uh, so they make their own judgment as to when they need to start and when they need to finish um, because they want to do a great job for the client so that the client stays and then they still have work. So I put that trust and responsibility on them to make their own decisions on how best they can manage our clients. Cool, cool. Yeah. Um, for those just starting out and really don't know much about this whole world, um, subcontractors, they they pay their own taxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So as a subcontractor, you really are your own business owner. You, uh, you could just start as a sole trader. So in New Zealand, you can start a business super easy by just being a sole trader, which means that you're just trading under your like own name. Um, you're filing your income and your expenses through your own personal tax return. Um, it's the easiest way to be a, a contractor. Uh, and so, yeah, you you need to be aware that as a contractor, you will pay ACC. So ACC mm -hmm. will automatically pay you, uh, send you a bill. I think it's after you, um, don't quote me on this, but I think it's after you file your first tax return where you're saying now that you're self-employed. Um, that will trigger the ACC to then send you an invoice. Um, and you also need to pay your own taxes. So you need to keep track of all of your income, all of your expenses. So anytime that you buy software or an office chair or a desk or camera or microphone or like headset, any of that stuff, you need to keep track of all of your expenses, just like any other business owner would so that you can um, put those through your tax return, all of your income, all of your expenses, and then you're paying tax on the difference. Um, in simple terms, please get an accountant. Please <laughs> talk to someone professional so that you're doing it right. And often you need to get the accountant because they will help you then actually claim all of the things that you can claim in terms of expenses. Um, so some of the things that I just listed off, there's a whole raft of things that you can actually claim as a contractor, which is one of the benefits of being a contractor versus an employee as well. Oh, I thought this was going to be a quick one, but oh, there's I, actually a lot to cover. <laughs> yeah, there really is. In in I hope that has given everyone some insights into what what being a subcontractor actually is going to mean on what you're going to be expected to do and that you need to be really responsible for yourself as your own business owner and take it really seriously. It's not like being an employee. Um, it shouldn't feel like being an employee. Um, otherwise, you're merging those lines between employee and contractor. Like you are your own business owner. You should be able to choose your own hours. But obviously, if you don't do a great job for the client, you're not responsive, you're never available, you lose the client that means that the agency is then not going to have that work for you. So, you know, like you, it, it's up to you. You are definitely in control of your hours in terms of keeping the clients. Do a really great job and they'll stick around. Yeah, I, I think my biggest takeaway, I, I think, from, you know, what we've just chatted about would be that, yes, some of the detail that you've gone into, Joe, with respect to your own agency Um Every agency is going to be slightly different. They're going to pay slightly differently. They're going to have different inductions. But the key thing is, is to have the conversation about all of this that we've talked about up front in that mm -hmm. first phone call. So you know exactly where you stand and you make sure that it is in that contract. So it is crystal clear. Yeah. And if anyone is an agency listening to this, um, we have the contractor templates, the um, the stages and steps and all of the training and guidelines about how to do this really well and how to hire those contractors um, so if you do want to have a look at that please do check out the members club $67 a month is an absolute bargain it's the most valuable um, thing that we have at Savvy School so yeah check that out so that you can do this well because if you do it well you look after your contractors you look after your clients you can have a really great um, relationship and this can be a really profitable option for you in terms of growing your your business. So 
um, yeah, check it out. Uh, if you are a subcontractor, make sure that you get onto, if you're in New Zealand, that um, contractor uh, directory. Super affordable as well, isn't it, Sam? And yeah, yeah, this is how I find my contractors. $30 for a year to yeah. be on the internal like, subcontractor directory. Yeah, we've made yeah, it really this affordable. Is, <laughs> this, this is my go-to. If I need to hire a contractor, it's the only place that I'm going to go. Uh, and I suspect that's for the same uh, the same for all of the other agencies around the country as well. Or even you don't even need to be saying I'm an agency to to get a contractor. It's like no. if you just want to grow your business. Yeah. Essentially, you're as soon as you hire a contractor, technically you'd be an agency. Um, but yeah, this is this is how you grow your business as you you hire contractors, and so that's the best place to go. So if you are a contractor not wanting to do the sales side of things, um, yeah, absolutely jump onto that directory. So I hope that helps. Thanks to everyone for listening to this episode of the Sam and Joe VA show. If you'd like to find out more, head to the Savvy School website to check out the amazing members club and find more free resources. You can find us at savvyschool.co.nz. 